So welcome to the last webinar in our series, What You See is What You Trust. My name is Olaf Bunke. I'm a senior advisor at the Alliance of Democracies Foundation and to the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. If you have followed our, uh, our series so far, you know that this is a joint production by the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity and Microsoft's Defending Democracy program. Uh, the intention of the series is to raise public awareness about the risks of foreign election meddling and specifically on the power of uh, disinformation. So today's session will focus on the very topical and interesting question of what governments can do about disinformation. But before we jump into the debate today, uh, let me give you a, a quick few housekeeping announcement. Uh, this uh, session will be on the record, obviously. We will stream it on Facebook and other channels right now. And you can also see it on YouTube uh, afterwards. Um, we will have, uh, after approximately 30 minutes of discussion with panelists, um, a Q&A. Um, Uh, forward them to our moderator, who is uh, um, Maritza Schake. She's a member of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. She's an international policy director of the Cyber Policy Center and the International Policy Fellow at the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence at Stanford University, a president of the Cyber Peace Institute and a long-standing member of the European Parliament specialized on digital issues. We couldn't be in better hands for this discussion. So thank you for tuning in. I wish us a fruitful, inspiring discussion today and the floor is yours. Thank Marie. you so much, Olaf, and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in yet another webinar. Uh, I don't know how many we can process, but here's another one and it's, it promises to be a very timely and important discussion. So uh, as the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, we have been looking at foreign interference, democracy, And I think uh, we are meeting to discuss this topic at a very, very uh, critical and also uh, challenging moment, especially as we look uh, in the United States at the protests that are going on, um, that are being uh, at times brutally um, uh, challenged by, by police officers, where press doesn't have the freedom to play its role. And so questions about, you know, how are people um, perceiving these demonstrations, where is information coming from, what is the narrative, and, and how does it all uh, blend into questions of foreign interference and uh, the erosion of trust in democracy, I think could not be more timely. Uh, and what we're going to do first to kick off the discussion with you all, so feel free to prepare your questions, is we're going to look at a number of videos to firstly give you a sense of what deep fakes and sort of manipulated videos from a technological point of view look like. We can then go into a discussion of when um, editing and sort of legitimate um, framing of stories blends into uh, deliberate confusion and uh, editing and manipulation of video to an extent that people cannot differentiate anymore and it, and it really becomes uh, a transparency and accountability problem. But we're also going to hear from uh, our experts that are that are with us today, and I'll briefly introduce them so that they can start their remarks right after the videos. Uh, we're very happy to welcome Laura Rosenberger. She's the director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, also very happy to welcome Meredith Berger. She's with Microsoft focusing on defending democracy and the co-sponsor of this uh, webinar series. And last but not least, we will be joined by Lutz Gwellner. He's the head of strategic communications at the European External Action Service. So uh, we will cover a wide spectrum of, of issues with these great speakers. And without further ado, Olaf, back over to you for some um, visual inspiration for what we're talking about and then the broader discussion about what is at stake today and what we can do, I think is also very important. Thanks so much for joining. Exactly. Thank you very much, Marici, for the introduction. When we prepared this, uh, of course, we we wanted to inspire you with what is what is possible by by editing videos, manipulating videos, manipulating visual content. 
So our, we had not in mind that the real reality on video right now, which we see, uh, especially from the US, could be as, uh, as powerful as it is right now. Still, I will share my screen with you and um, give you uh, a couple of examples we think are uh, uh, generic uh, when we talk about uh, disinformation. Um, so first of all, of course, disinformation on politics is uh, not a new phenomenon. So we could go back in history. In 1924, uh, we have seen a very prominent um, example called the Zinyarev uh, letter, uh, which was a fake document published by the British uh, Daily Mail newspaper four days before the general elections in October 2094. And to cut the story short, uh, due to this manipulated document, the Conservatives won the October elections instead of the Labour government. So we have seen since then multiple examples of uh, manipulated information causing significant harm to democratic processes, actors, and uh, institutions. But where are we today when it comes to disinformation, or as we call it in the good old days, fake news? So in the area of widespread populism around the world, we can put on record that it is more important to control the emotional dimension uh, of a political discourse, like the framing of the issue, uh, instead of making sure that you have all the facts right. And that's why fake news and disinformation in general has such priority. So there are mixed views on the impact. Some research um, downplay the impact that fake news had on political outcomes. But at the same time, we can see that many platforms like Facebook and Twitter have dramatically changed their business models to try and respond to these issues uh, in the past. So the intersection of a range of factors creates something of a tinderbox for democracies these days. So politics is currently fragmented in many countries. Measured trust of citizens towards their governments is low. Social media creates vast echo chambers, and we have a number of crucial elections uh, coming up in the next couple of years around the world. So but one of the interesting questions, and then I start the videos, uh, is of course for the upcoming elections, if visual disinformation material will be even more impactful than what we have seen with shared fake news, uh, like in the 2016 US election. So let's have a look at four short generic, uh, generic examples. The first, uh, and, and those who are dealing with the issue will know them uh, probably all, maybe instead of one. Uh, the first was the Nancy Pelosi slurred speech where- They had um, a press conference in the Rose Garden. You could see the, this, um, it was slowed down. Sure, sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before I said most currently that he was engaged in a cover-up. However, compare that version to one from C-SPAN. And then he had a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before I said most current. So that was, that was the first one. The voice was not mine. The second one, which was interesting, where a candidate used um, uh, edited material was in the recent Bloomberg primary campaign uh, when Bloomberg all of a sudden posted this video on Twitter. I'm the only one here that I think has ever started a business. Is that fair? Okay, I'm the only one here that I think this ever started. As you can see, it has a very emotional effect, but of course the, the, the truth is this was, um, this was edited and, um, and not uh, the original video. Um, um, it was uh, edited, actually, they, they collected a couple of pauses within the debate, actually after two seconds, uh, people responded to what he was saying. So now let me try to... Uh, I need to move the bar here. Okay, so this is uh, the one actually you might not have seen. We created this Hello, ourselves. Hello, Mr. President. Thank you for joining us at the Global Democracy Summit. It is great to have you here with us. Hello, everybody. It's great to speak to you all. You know, I love democracy. Nobody loves democracy like I do. I think that's why I got elected. Mr. President, have you been here to Copenhagen before? I've visited a few times before, and it's an incredible city. Strong economy, they've got there. Strong economy and a whole lot of bicycles. 
I've never been too fond of cycling. I have tremendously good health, so I don't need to exercise too much. It's very strong heart, my doctor says. Okay, this, this was um, produced for the Alliance of Democracies Foundation for the last Copenhagen Democracy Summit last year. It is totally deep fake. Uh, don't concentrate too much on the video, but listen to the audio. We are kind of proud that the audio really went well. This was an artificial intelligence feed it with Trump uh, lines and uh, we scripted the, what, what he said in this uh, faked uh, interview. Um, and there you can see how powerful the next generation of synthetic media manipulation can be. And uh, therefore I will conclude with presenting the most impactful and I think most convincing video, although it's still from 2018. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is gonna be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Okay, so that was the little... <laughs> Sorry, YouTube, thank you. The little uh, presentation, the question of course beyond this is what can governments do about it? So some of you might smile watching these videos, other might shake their, hand, uh, their hats, but the question of course is okay, if you manipulate political content to have a specific event, uh, in fact, if you want to manipulate an election by spreading disinformation like these videos uh, two days ahead of an election, the question is should a government force platforms to re remove content? Uh, should they label it? We have seen some examples. Uh, and with this, I give it back to the panel. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion on that. Thank you. Great. Well, that's quite the scene setter. Um, now on to introductions from our panelists. Um, Laura, may I start with you, please? Absolutely. Um, thanks, uh, Maricha, and thanks, Ola, for, um, for bringing us all together today and for that, um, the, the powerful visuals that you showed there. Um, I think I'm going to start by just panning out um, for a moment to talk about some of the broader trends that, that you hit on. Um, you know, while I think, Olaf, you framed the initial conversation around disinformation in the context of elections, um, I think many of us who've been studying disinformation and information operations have been saying for quite some time that elections um, are, are often not really the, the key focal point. They are one target in ongoing operations that are meant to undermine the integrity of the information space and um, citizens' faith in information and really um, the idea of truth. And we're seeing that now unfold in the context of multiple um, crises, both in the US and globally. Um, and these crises, of course, when you have rapidly moving information, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of emotions, um, that these crises provide a ripe surface um, for bad actors to exploit. Um, and of course, one of those um, crises uh, is um, COVID-19 and the global pandemic. And um, we have seen um, a significant amount of, um, of disinformation um, and misinformation um, in what the WHO has, has labeled an infodemic um, alongside the pandemic. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And of course, we're also seeing 
um, what I will call the broader weaponization of information um, in the context of the mass protests um, that are unfolding across the US right now and um, where we're seeing actually solidarity um, in a number of um, not only European cities, but, um, but cities around the world. Um, and, and I think that the weaponization of information in that context um, you know, includes not just um, disinformation and misinformation, which we have certainly seen, um, but also um, you know, incitement of violence um, using uh, social media um, and online information platforms. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment as well. Briefly, in the context of, of COVID-19, um, there's been a lot of disinformation and misinformation from domestic actors in many countries, many of whom are seeking um, financial gain to take advantage of these crises and people's fears around them. Um, but we've also seen a significant amount of um, what I would call um, activity in the geopolitical information contest, the global information contest, where uh, nation states, um, particularly authoritarian regimes or authoritarian actors, are seeking to um, leverage this moment um, and, and information in it for their own gain. China has been a particular, um, particularly egregious actor in this context. Um, and we've seen evolution in Chinese information operation tactics in the context of, of COVID-19. Some of these started around the Hong Kong protests last year, where we saw the first evidence of um, Chinese state-linked information operations on Western social media platforms. Um, we've now seen um, significant um, information operations from Chinese party state actors, um, most of this in the overt space. Um, the spreading of coordinated disinformation um, via their own diplomats and officials through their state media, um, particularly about the origin of the virus and trying to deflect blame from China, um, but also um, really seeking uh, to create um, the impression that, that China um, and its system um, is to democracies. Um, and trying to draw a contrast there, again, really to deflect blame from, from China's own initial failings about the virus. There's been some evidence from, uh, from some other researchers pointing to covert activity as well um, on, uh, on Western social media platforms from Chinese linked actors. Attribution there is always very hard, um, but it does seem like um, the US intelligence community has found some similar things according to press reports. Um, turning really quickly to the protests, um, I want to be really clear here because I think this is really important. I know uh, myself and a number of U.S. disinfo researchers were inundated over the weekend um, with questions from reporters and questions um, from, from others asking, um, is there evidence of problematic aspects of these information operations that we've seen in Russia and in the US and other contexts over the past few years is that it makes us paranoid about everything. We begin to trust nothing. We begin to see a Russian of it under every rock. And um, my own team, um, researchers at a company called Graphica and researchers at the um, Stanford Internet Observatory have all concluded that to date we have seen um, nothing that would indicate a role of any foreign actor in precipitating the protests. These are authentic. And I think it's really important that we not allow um, concerns about um, foreign activity on, on social media platforms um, to be used to discredit legitimate protesters. Now, that's not to say that authoritarian around, regimes around the world aren't um, loving to take advantage um, of the uh, chaotic scenes of um, of protests and police brutality against protesters and um, you know, police murder of, of African Americans um, to discredit democracy, and that's for sure. Um, but to date, we've seen very little disinformation or misinformation around that. So I just really wanted to be very clear on that. On the topic of uh, visual disinformation, um, Olaf, and, and your um, presentation, I think it's important to note that while um, many of us are concerned about deep fakes in the long run, um, a lot of what you showed and what we've actually seen in the wild um, is what a lot of people call cheap fakes or shallow fakes. Um, and, and I think it's very easy, it shows just how easy it is um, to, um, to deceive those and to take advantage of 
um, of platforms uh, to do that. We've also, in the visual space, seen um, the explosion of what many call mimetic warfare, um, which I'd say is another form of, of visual disinformation. Um, while it may not be video, um, it's again, this isn't about um, facts or information or truth. This is about using visual memes um, uh, in order to convey often a very emotional message um, about a particular event. Um, and those have get, gotten particular um, traction on platforms like Instagram that are obviously very um, visually focused. Um, I'll, I'll touch just in the last minute very briefly on, um, on government roles, and, and we'll come back to this, I think. Um, but we've obviously seen a lot of conversation about this in the U.S. Um, over the past couple of weeks as um, different platforms have been thinking about different approaches and policies to deal with government actors um, who weaponize information. And from my perspective, one of the most important things that elected leaders in democratic countries can do um, in order to combat disinformation is to engage themselves in truthful and transparent use of information. When we see elected leaders in democratic countries weaponize information, it undermines our own democracies and make us, makes us more vulnerable to disinformation from other actors. The, the other thing I think I just wanna point to is um, the continued importance of a free press um, in pushing back in disinformation. And government has a particular role um, in protecting that. You know, in the US, it's um, embodied in our First Amendment to the Constitution. Um, government shall make no law to um, infringe on the freedom of the press. And um, that is core to how our democracy functions. And uh, the press has already been um, under siege or under strain from, um, from trends in social media um, and from COVID where we've seen mass layoffs in a lot of newsrooms. And now we have had, of course, elected leaders who are, um, who are making um, the press enemies. And we're seeing that now play out um, in graphic form with the targeting of journalists in the context of protests. And um, I think all these things are exactly the wrong thing to be doing in the context of government pushing back on disinformation. Um, I think it's really, really important um, that how we respond to disinformation be rooted in democratic values and principles um, and not go the other direction. So a lot more to touch on there um, and I've gone on too long already. So, so I'll stop and, and um, hand it back to, to Maricha. Thank you so much. I think this is this is a really good um, conversation starter about the variety of, of critical, critical issues that are going on, but also the significance of responding appropriately. And I think that from an analysis of the problem, it is really urgent that we go on to uh, an agenda for change if we want to fight back uh, and make our democracies more resilient. So uh, thanks for that. We'll get back to discussion later. I would like to ask Meredith now to share her thoughts on what Microsoft is doing. There we go. Um, thank you, Mary Chin. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Meredith Berger uh, with Microsoft's Defending Democracy program. Um, when I saw this series, it reminded me of a joke, and it's often attributed to um, an American comedian named Groucho Marx. And um, I'm hoping it's somewhere else. I'm starting with my own info ops, which is not a good way to start this conversation. But the joke goes, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? And I think that's important to, to think about because it, it talks about how we keep the people in the mix, that we wanna make sure that we're thinking about the people who are affected by all of these various information operations and campaigns and what it means to actually be on the receiving end of that. So I wanna make sure that we keep that in our conversation, but asking people to decide whether they trust themselves or the information presented to them or somewhere in between, what a question that is. And um, Laura made a lot of good points around um, kind of the severity of that question. But when you put people in that position, you create insecurity, which influences decisions, which leads to misinformed actions, and it has impacts at the societal, the institutional, and um, individual levels. And that's pretty consequential. So um, we, as uh, disinformation directly threatens democracy. It undermines integrities of institutions, delegitimizes governance structures, erodes trusts, exacerbates political and social divides. It creates physical and national security issues, undermines free press, the exchange of ideas, a lot of the great points that Laura um, has hit on. And democracy is broader than the traditional institutions, like Laura said as well, that come to mind, um, such as elections, voting, development of laws and statutes, but those are important. 
Um, but I think what we're talking about here today is that information and the flow of information is a real core tenet of that democracy. And so like Laura and Marije and also Olaf have um, said, I want to acknowledge the global and social context in which we're having this conversation in a world that's wrought by pandemic and protests. And in the US, we're, we often forget we're at the um, middle of an election cycle right now and, and headed into it full force along with other countries and their elections to follow. Um, this conversation is a timely one. We're seeing the power of information in democracy. It moves quickly, it travels far, wide, fast, with great impact, and the same is true of disinformation. Um, so some of you watching might wonder why um, Microsoft is here. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I told you a little bit about our Defending Democracy program. About two years ago, in early um, 2018, Microsoft created the Defending Democracy program because we believe that technology companies have a responsibility to help protect our democratic processes and institutions. So we've worked with stakeholders everyone from governments to non-government entities to academics, political committees and campaigns, um, industry, peers and partners, and we work to protect elections around the world. Um, our work falls under three main pillars, protecting campaigns, securing elections, and defending against disinformation. I know we'll spend a lot of time on pillar number three today, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in the first space. Um, while disinformation certainly goes um, beyond elections and we see its effects broadly, and I know we'll get into that more today, we do think a lot about elections and protecting elections at the Defending Democracy program. As an example, we just have a few solutions um, that we've offered in this space to help people um, be thoughtful about and secure against um, the threats from a lot of the actors that Laura mentioned in her introductory remarks. Um, so we have programs like M365 for campaigns, which allows people to work over email fire sharing um, and collaborate securely to make sure that they're working in an environment where they're work and their emails and, and all of their um, systems there are secure. Um, we also have account guard. We recently rolled this out for election officials. Um, and this is a service that notifies organizations of cyber attacks and threat activity across their emails when they're Office 365 customers. We have election security advisors that um, help to both prepare on the front end and reactive you know, heaven forbid there is an attack on the back end um, to help with remediation and expertise. Um, and then we're looking forward ahead towards um, the possibility of increasing integrity in the vote process with something called Election Guard. Um, it'll help make elections more secure with end-to-end -end verifiability using open source software. Um, of course, we're focused on disinformation here today, and so a lot of the work that we do in that space is around um, education and partnership and promoting authoritative content. Um, two examples, and I, I know that you all got to hear from them a little bit in previous panels, um, but with a partner of ours, NewsGuard, we provide um, authoritative content and notification of authoritative content with media nutrition labels to help people be more educated about the news that they're taking in. And secondly, um, another example, we um, work with the University of Washington Center for Informed Public, where we really try to work and promote news literacy. I know you had Jevin West um, talking a little bit about that effort, along with Anna Sophie from um, NewsGuard last time on your panel. And so I won't repeat there. I know we're going to go into some more. But um, thank you, Olaf, for the introductory images as well. I think it gave a great span of the different ways that we see synthetic media used. And um, I think it's important to note that there there's synthetic media, a lot of good uses out there. We're talking about the malicious kind um, and the effect that it has on people, their perception of truth, and the overall democracy that, that we are trying to have around the world. Um, so I look forward to the continued conversation, and thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Meredith. It's, it's really good to know what a big, powerful company like Microsoft is, is doing in this space with you know, its ecosystem and, and view from the inside, so to say. Um, I'm afraid that one of our panelists has not reached us here online yet. Uh, so what I would suggest is to have a look at whether there's any questions from uh, the audience. And um, in the meantime, let me let me try to dig a little bit deeper uh, into the question that Laura touched upon, but but to understand better 
um, the geopolitical motives that we see at play. It strikes me that more and more people also in my own personal uh, circles are susceptible to really challenging you know, authorities and institutions that, that long enjoyed more trust. And it seems that um, you know, a wide variety of cases, online information has, has sown the seed for this particular kind of mistrust, which may not be overall, but which may have to do now with, with the COVID um, pandemic or with, in general, questions about you know, media politician. And so um, where, where the discussion initially focused quite a bit on, you know, who should be an arbiter of truth, we still hear this from Mark Zuckerberg, and questions about, you know, does it matter if somebody wants to claim the earth is flat, because we can verify that it's not, and then move on. Um, could you say a little bit about motives that you think are important and also why it is important to get the motives correctly, to perceive exactly what is going on? Because I feel like there's even a lot of confusion about what disinformation is and not about. So if we can clarify that uh, for, for our audience today, I think that would help. Uh, Great, Maricha. I think it's a really important question. So look, I'm gonna answer it through a couple different lenses. The first is, you know, on that last point about what disinformation is really about. Um, for me, I actually think, um, you know, within the, the community that works on these issues, we've had a lot of debates and conversations over the past few years about terminology. I'm increasingly of the view that the use of the term disinformation is problematic, um, just as the term um, fake news, which I never use um, because it's been so appropriated and misunderstood, um, is problematic. I actually think disinformation is problematic for the reason that it misses the point of most of the activity that we see. Disinformation is deliberately false information. Most of what we see is information that is manipulated in one way or another, um, either for emotional purposes. Um, sometimes it's not even the content itself that's manipulated, it's the way it's transmitted, right? So when you talk about computational strategies that make some information or some content seem much more prevalent than it actually is, um, when we talk about the use of false personas to convey information, much of this is actually not quantifiably false or true information. Um, it is information that is manipulated in one way or another um, for a specific end. And therefore, I tend to use the term information manipulation um, because I think it captures a broader category of what we're actually seeing. Disinformation is absolutely one tactic of that kind of manipulation, but it is, I think, um, a narrow slice. And I think the other problem when we talk about this in terms of disinformation specifically is that that seems to distort the way we think about impact. Um, it seems to be, um, you know, we're thinking of it in the terms of um, has somebody been convinced that this of this lie, of this conspiracy theory, whatever. Um, but many times as we've seen, and as I mentioned earlier, that's actually not the point. The point is eroding our trust and faith in our institutions um, and in information itself. It's often about creating confusion and so many conflicting ideas that we think that there is no truth. And um, as we heard earlier, you know, in a deliberative democracy, having some foundation for a debate is absolutely critical. And if we can't accept the idea that those with whom we are debating are also debating based on the same facts we are, um, it's, it's a really slippery slope for where we end up with democracy. So that's on that, on that last point. So let's put that then in the context of the geopolitical that's underway. Um, and not to get too sort of foreign policy wonky on folks here, but I'm of the view that we are um, in a, in a phase where, um, of geopolitics where we are seeing um, that, that contest defined as a struggle between authoritarian and democratic systems. Um, and um, I think therefore, while it's always critical for us to embrace our democratic principles, um, we need to understand that it's democracy itself um, that is the contested battleground of geopolitics today. And authoritarian regimes 
are using different means, um, most of them non-military, uh, in order to erode the foundations of democracy and advance authoritarian norms that make the world more safe for regimes like Putin's um, and like the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and it's therefore critical that we understand um, that the very root of how we respond has to be a democratic approach, because it is that very democratic worldview that is under siege. And, and that's why when we come to some of the conversation later, we can talk about it, but I'm very concerned about government calls for um, platforms to engage in more censorship um, of speech, because I think that that actually is the kind of authoritarian approach um, of closing off information spaces um, that that I um, I think that that regimes like um, Beijing and Moscow really really want to see. Thanks. I think that that last point about who should decide uh, on what measures to take and what measures are appropriate if we want to defend free democratic uh, rule of law based societies. Um, you know, where are the right areas to intervene, and is it regulatory? Is it otherwise. So Meredith, let me turn to you and ask you how you perceive the role of, of tech companies. Uh, it's, it's a very hot topic. Uh, there is almost like a, a civil strife going on in Silicon Valley uh, between CEOs that take different trajectories here. Um, would, you, would you care to share some thoughts about what you think tech companies should do, can do, as they create communities, as they make decisions on governance that are quite impactful in addressing some of the questions that are that are the most urgent also for democracy today. Sure. Um, and I, I think, yes, that's, that is a very hot topic right now. Um, and, and I'll offer that um, I think that some of the best things that um, tech companies can do, and I'll, I'll start with one that um, we try to do at Microsoft, is um, engage in types of, of newsletters, see and promoting authoritative content. And I think what it comes down to is um, you want to make sure that you're putting the, the best sources of news there for people to be able to consume. But this is different to Laura's point, and I think the point in your question to actually being the arbiter of what sort of content is on these platforms. Those are, those are very distinct um, things and things that should remain um, distinct part of democracy as we've been hitting on again and again is that access to information and that's all different types of information. And so when we think about what tech companies are, are doing, it's um, how we can help to reduce exposure to information that um, might be harmful or um, of low authority. And then also think about how to reduce belief because that's how uh, mis and disinformation and any sort of information campaign is going to spread is because people are believing it. And so you see examples like labeling or providing context or providing different sources of content to increase people's um, view and the type of information that they're bringing in. And it's that diversity of perspective, the diversity of information, but maintaining the information that is out there that's important to democracy. And I think that's where the balance is. Sorry, let me ask another question um, about you know, how we are to understand risk, but also how we are to understand what's even happening at all. So I used to be a member of the European Parliament. I now work at a university. And it's interesting that a lot of the questions are similar in the sense of, you know, what do we really know as outsiders, whether it's journalists or academics or parliamentarians, about what is happening uh, in the architecture where information flows, what kind of information flows we see. So I want to ask both of you, a, both a simple and a very difficult question, which is, does the public, do independent regulators, uh, journalists, civil society organizations, citizens, do they know enough? Laura. Do they know enough? It's a broad question. Um, I think, ugh, I'm trying to think of how to break that out. Um, so, what I think that most civil society organizations don't know enough about is what to do. Um, one colleague on my team in particular has done a lot of work with groups like the National Urban League and the League of Women Voters 
who know that they need to equip um, their, uh, their, their members, um, uh, their constituents, um, with tools to know how to deal with disinformation, um, to educate them on it, but they don't know how to do it. And I think one of the challenges is that, um, you know, this is uh, an issue that it crosses um, sectors from the public sector to the private sector to civil society. And I, I know um, that there was another event in this series that, that focused on both of those um, sectors. Um, but there's, it's also an issue that, that crosses sort of domain expertise. And so um, civil society actors that are used to focusing on um, many of the, the challenges in their own communities don't necessarily have the expertise in these kinds of issues. I think increasingly um, they are aware of the need to, to gain that expertise or to at least um, bring that expertise to their constituents. And I think those of us in the um, analytic and, and research community who work on these issues need to be doing more um, to facilitate and enable that. Um, I think for those of us in the civil society space that are focused on these issues um, and doing research and analysis on them, um, I also think that, you know, we, we do know a lot, but we probably need to be better in, in how we relay that information and explain it um, and not just be talking to ourselves um, as, as other experts, but really getting outside of our own bubbles. Um, because, you know, I, I think many of us um, probably on this screen here have been parts of the same conversations with the same groups of people on the same issues for three plus more years now. Um, and um, if we're really going to move the ball forward, we have to actually link up with other civil society actors in a new and different way. Um, and, and, you know, I think moments like what we're seeing in the U.S. actually may be um, opportunities um, for for that kind of, of um, engagement, but I think we need to see a whole lot more of it. Thanks for that, Meredith. Do you have thoughts on this topic? Yeah, just sorry. I'm just wondering. Sorry, the, sorry. I'm trying to analyze if there are different cultures in place when we talk about how this information can be mitigated in Europe and in the US and and the, the the current situation shows it quite clearly that that in a hyper polarized society like in the US right now of course you you are it's so I'm asking myself sort of if all these fact checking institutions and all these attempts actually for media literacy can really make a difference if it's in the end as I said in in my little presentation maybe just about the framing and less about having the facts straight so the question is is there any democratic, legitimate counter tactic, uh, which is not just based on, on educating people, but also in, in trying, and I think this is part of all what we are doing actually to, to make people understand how the system of manipulated information, I like that term by the way, um, is actually working and what it does. And the interesting thing is, so I had a lot of conversations here in Germany um, about it uh, since we started our project with the Transatlantic Commission uh, two years ago. But the first time that my friends understood what we are talking about was when they shared the first fake news they received in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. In the very beginning, in, in early March, uh, someone shared an audio message. So it was the classical pattern we've seen from other um, um, examples during the election interference. So that a woman uh, claiming, so she's not giving any name, but claiming, okay, I have some inside knowledge about uh, a study done at the university in a specific German country, uh, city, uh, which proved that, that ibuprofen actually is, uh, is amplifying coronavirus and you should take another medication, another medicine. So, and, and it was so real and, and all of a sudden I had a couple of, so really a handful of friends with the same message and they all were sharing it. And then I was the guy who was, yeah, I was the party pooper actually saying, hey, listen what, I don't believe this is the truth. And people looked at me and said, 
how can you tell actually so this is totally reliable and whatsoever so long story short within 24 hours this specific university made a disclaimer saying we never did this study and we never made that claim so this is false information and all of a sudden within my friend circle we had a conversation about what can you trust and i had the same thing then another thing popped up and all of a sudden i had friends who said you know what in the end i don't trust anything uh, and this is exactly what you mentioned at the beginning. This is not really about sharing false information. It's much more er the attempt to eroding the system and the belief of citizens and democracies that our system is working. And I think that, but then you still have, you can see that there are different cultures in place. For instance, in Germany, we have this network, uh, this Nets DG uh, law, which is kind of a hate speech law. Uh, which uh, uh, um, where, where the government actually forced Facebook to uh, do criminal investigation on on um, some claims, and they had to introduce a button for this. It was kind of an accepted measure in the German context, but still, in the end, this was where the interconnection to the other seminars and the other webinars we we had so far comes, is that the the German government still did not invent a tool actually to really make Facebook follow the new rules. So, and then it comes really to the question, okay, how do we make uh, the big tech platforms and Microsoft is a little bit different because you don't have a social media platform as such, um, uh, how to make that, play that game together with the democratic institutions and the current conversation we see uh, where Mark Zuckerberg is in the middle of it. Um, uh, is a very topical one and my my bet is that he has to surrender at some point because uh, those actually who are trying to test the the, the boundaries of this uh, system actually are pushing it even further and further and there will be a time when the system also of Facebook will collapse but that's a very personal opinion. Thanks for that. That uh, I'm going to take a question from the audience. Thanks for um, uh, asking it. Uh, the question is from Jose Torreblanca. He says, "Do you think that Twitter is doing the right thing, confronting Facebook? I think is or Trump is, I guess, what he wants to say. Uh, and what about Facebook not following up? Uh, doesn't from Twitter flow that they should do the same with the Chinese or Russian embassies' accounts in our democracies, which they are using to spread disinformation?" Laura, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to start on that. So I think it's important, um, number one, to understand, you know, what um, Twitter has and hasn't done, and what other platforms have and haven't done. Um, so you know, Twitter has a number of different steps that they can take in enforcing their um, terms of service. Um, it includes labeling content um, with additional information. Um, which we've seen them do um, with respect to one of President Trump's tweets um, uh, when it related to, I'm sorry, I think it was two of his tweets that related to um, mail uh, voting um, where he had incorrect information and where Twitter has a policy um, about um, not spreading um, false information about voting um, because it's considered voter suppression, um, which by the way is a crime in the United States. Um, and um, so, so that's one category. Another is um, to um, hide um, certain contents um, and limit its ability to be shared um, by putting a warning uh, message in front of it that you can then still see the content if you click through it. Um, it's just um, you, see a, you see a warning um, there first. Um, uh, Snapchat has done something um, as well, uh, um, which I think has gotten a little less attention um, given everything else happening over the past couple of days. But Snapchat has also um, stopped promoting um, President Trump's um, feed, um, which is another step that um, platforms can take when they actually um, affirmatively promote certain kinds of, of content. Um, you know, I think um, I think that it's. Uh, it is very important when thinking about public officials um, that um, we bear in mind um, that that citizens do have. Um, it is important for them to hear from from those public 
officials, but at the same time, those public officials um, probably have access to more channels for getting information out than almost any anyone else under under the sun. Um, and frankly, I'd say the President of the United States has the largest bully pulpit um, that exists um, in the world. Um, and um, and I think that, that these decisions also need to be taken um, in that context. Twitter has actually taken certain enforcement actions as well against some foreign government officials um, in the past few days, um, including against Chinese um, uh, government officials, one of China's um, spokespeople's um, tweets um, that uh, included the disinformation I mentioned earlier about the origin of the virus um, has also now been labeled by Twitter um, for violating one of its policies, just like Twitter labeled President Trump's tweet. So I think we are starting to see um, Twitter in particular become much more aggressive in applying these standards to government actors in, in general. I think on the, um, you know, on the state actors question and, and state media in general, um, I think it's really, really important actually for platforms to take steps that provide additional context and transparency for people about where they're getting information. One of the problems we see right now with a lot of state-backed media and state actors on social media platforms is that a lot of people don't, don't know um, that they are getting information from, um, from state-backed media sources when they get it on social media. They don't know uh, what CGTN is. They don't know, um, uh, you know what Ruptly is. Um, and, um, and I think that, that providing additional information for people on the origin of information um, so that they can understand the motivation of the actors that are sharing that information is incredibly important to making sure that people um, can evaluate information critically. And when we don't have that kind of information attached, um, it's a really big problem. So I think we could talk a lot more about that, but I, I see that Lutz has joined us. So I'm going to stop talking as well um, so we can hopefully hear from him. Thank you, Laura, and uh, welcome, Lutz. Uh, for a couple more minutes, we'll be on. So what I suggest we do is, is not to inject another introductory statement now. It would just be a little confusing uh, in an already very rich and diverse discussion about manipulation uh, of information and um, the integrity of trust and democracy really at large. Um, so let me return to all of you for final thoughts, really, on a question that Kaya uh, Kilic asked. And I think is one that a lot of people are seeking answers to, including myself. So I had a discussion with a journalist a couple of days ago about, you know, what, what to do with, let's say, a neighbor or a friend or a family member that actually is convinced of um, some conspiracy theory or is, is sharing messages online. What is the best meaning, most effective way to deal with it? So do we have practical examples or recommendations and, and maybe I'll start with Lutz there just because it's your bread and butter to deal with, uh, with disinformation and, and hand people tools to actually navigate through this very complicated space. So um, how can we very pragmatically uh, provide a, a good counter avenue when we ourselves find people that are susceptible to some, you know, um, harmful and manipulated content? Absolutely. So first of all, all my apologies uh, for this. And I'm really sorry I missed the first part uh, of this discussion. Let me jump into your, your question right away. I think what Laura just said is tremendously important, is not so much about convincing people what they should think or what they should not think or what is right or wrong. I think this would be exactly the wrong avenue. It would only reinforce views. It would only strengthen kind of defiance, you know, against uh, whatever, what is perceived as mainstream media or mainstream views. What is important to show what is the risk of being manipulated? I think this is really the core for, for me, also in our work uh, that we are doing here, is, is to show it's, we are not the police of telling what is, what is right or wrong, what you guys can say or not, or what should be written or not. But if we see, for example, from state actors, if we see um, simultaneous publication in state media or state controlled media, in social media, kind of a, in a coordinated and very clearly intentional way of pushing certain narratives, 
then is not the narrative in itself the problem, it's the manipulation behind, because people get the idea this is either mainstream or they get the confirmation, et cetera. And you can continue this argument a bit further uh, in the sense of, you know, watch also what you, what you get on your social media channels, et cetera. And I think people are quite, quite susceptible, kind of susceptible to this argument because nobody wants to be um, manipulated. I don't normally be told from somebody what I, what I can think or what I should think, but I want to, to be relatively clear that I'm not manipulated in my views. And I think this is the key uh, to dealing with this issue. And maybe the other point, since uh, I'm so sorry that I couldn't join earlier and make, make this point, but just to weave it in also, that would have been a core argument in my, in my introductory statement, would have been, let's not please put everything in the same pot, you know? Conspiracy theories, misinformation, disinformation, foreign interference, these are different things also. These are, maybe they use some of the same techniques, or we see it in the same way, but the policy responses to them need to be very, very different. And Mauricio, you know this also from your own home country, you know, where kind of this debate was very kind of violent uh, for some time. And now people have understood that, well, we don't want to be, we don't want to be told um, or want, don't want to be manipulated uh, about what happened to uh, MH17, for example. And this is, I think, the argument that uh, will, first of all, convince people to, to have a second look. This is also, in my view, a legitimate role of, uh, of public authorities, of course, also of, uh, of civil society, and even more so of civil society, is to approach the issue a little bit with a, I would call it a bit like consumer protection mode, you know? I'm, I'm an information consumer, and I want to be sure that I'm not kind of being played with by whoever it is, might be domestic, might be external actors. This no, is I agree. A long answer I think, to your, to no, your. no, that's great. And I think the empowerment of people hits two targets. One, of course, that they are, you know, in a position to navigate the complex information space themselves, but also that, you know, empowering people to participate is in turn vital for participating in democracy. If you lose out on people's engagement, then that is a sort of secondary harm you can do if you want to erode a liberal democracy uh, at all. So uh, let me now turn to Meredith for some last thoughts before we conclude in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Sure, and I'll, I'll just pick up on, on this stream and um, the, the question that we, we got in. And I think that one of the best things that uh, people can do as individuals is if, if you see that the information is um, not good content, ill-founded, not true, um, call it. I think the best favor that you can do to someone is tell them that they are sharing information that isn't correct. Um, most of the time, it's it's not that the people who are passing the bad information are the ones who have conceived of it or who are even intending to be passing it forward. And so to the extent that you can go to someone and say, hey, this, this might not be right and point them in the right direction is a tremendous favor and a, and a great individual action to take. Um, but each I've heard you talk thoughtfully about this before, about how people will go to the people that they trust for information. And often the trust that you assign with the person is also assigned to the information that they're passing. And that's something to consider, especially in these one-on-one -on -one conversations, and especially in a time where people aren't sure where to turn. Um, I, I said, you know, who, who are you gonna believe, um, me or your lion eyes? The, the risk of over-educating, of course, is that people aren't sure what's true and what's not anymore. And we're seeing evidence of um, echoes where originally something was promoted that was um, a piece of bad information from an information campaign of some sort. Then it's corrected and then it's recorrected again to say, oh, no, that's not true. The original thing was true. And so we have to think about these chains of custody, um, and custody probably isn't a great word to use here in, in terms of information that is not carefully guarded and intended to have an emotional response. Um, but think, think in the way that these things travel the same way good information can travel, and that's um, 
and that emotional impact, that emotional response of going to someone that you trust and who trusts you and, and correcting it. And uh, to Laura's point when we were talking, and Luke said this as well, talking about taxonomy and language and, and the different definitions of language, that's something that I think is very important for practitioners, but that doesn't carry as well for people who are just being impacted by these campaigns. And so it's an important differentiator um, that I think everybody has hit on, but I wanted to, to hit on it again as well. Um, so if you if you see something um, that's not true out there, call it, help people correct the, um, the bad information that's spreading. Thank you, that's very helpful. Also to touch on the emotional side, which sometimes as we try to analyze with ever more pre precision, we could risk losing, losing sight of Laura. A few last thoughts before we wrap up. Thanks, well this has been a great conversation and it's always great to um, appear with such a, a wonderful group of, of folks thinking so thoughtfully about these issues. I think one of the challenges um, that many of us always get asked about is, you know, what can what can people practically do? Um, and and I think um, there are several different things. And and some of this may sound off topic, um, but I hope not. One, um, if you have the means to do so, subscribe to your local um, newspaper. Um, uh, we see the collapse of of traditional media happening, and particular local media happening, um, in so many places. And especially right now between COVID and protests, um, we are seeing the renewed importance of local journalism who can report on what's happening in our own communities. And so I think that's one very practical thing if you have the means that you can do. I think another um, thing is, you know, uh, I think it's really important, as Merit said, that we not overlearn some of these um, uh, lessons and become so skeptical of everything that we see. Um, but it is really important, um, I think if something makes you very emotional, um, to just stop and think, um, you know, could somebody here have a motivation in, in sharing this? And then, you know, do what, what all researchers do um, when digging into a topic, um, triangulate, see if there are other confirmation, other sources to confirm a particular piece of information. Um, I think that's that's really important um, as we all try to um, fortify uh, the the quality um, and integrity of the information space um, for for all of us. Thank you. I think that's uh, that's very helpful. Let me quickly conclude conclude by thanking you so much, uh, all the panelists, everyone for calling in, everybody for uh, listening to, to us online later. Uh, what I can assure you is that the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity will continue to assess the various aspects of the challenges we're dealing with, um, both to deeply understand what is going on in the space of dis and misinformation and all the right terminology, how it impacts democratic resilience, uh, societal trust and uh, basically the the um, communities that we all uh, care about so, so much, uh, but also um, to have practical solutions and to try to really pave the way for empowering people uh, as citizens in democracies, but also as um, watchful individuals who can actually do something to push back against uh, those who want to harm us. And so um, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to continuing this, this difficult but necessary conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maritza. Uh, it's my privilege to conclude this uh, with a final uh, thank you remark to all of you. Um, uh, as we uh, mentioned in the very beginning, this is the concluding third part of a three-part webinar. So the other two are already on YouTube, one on media literacy, the other one on platform and private sector responses to disinformation. So make sure uh, you have a look at that too. Uh, as Maricha said, we will continue on this. Uh, there's a new webinar already in almost in production, focusing on exactly what Laura said on the question of how journalism uh, and and um, how to say so reliable journalism actually needs to navigate in these uh, times of disinformation and how actually this job has changed in uh, given these new circumstances. Um, uh, we were working uh, on this uh, and, and produce it uh, um, as soon as possible. Uh, but there is also a big, big uh, event coming up uh, for the Alliance of Democracies Foundation, which is the Copenhagen Democracy Summit 2020. Uh, we start this on June 18th and 
important is covering much more than just the issue of disinformation or election interference. It, we touch upon uh, many aspects of uh, what democracies are facing these days in the world. We will host a lot of democracy activists from around the world. We will uh, have um, uh, an input from Joshua Wong from Hong Kong, for instance, uh, but we'll also have uh, a prominent uh, uh, politicians like Madeleine Albright, John Kerry, uh, and others um, speaking to us uh, on the two days, 18th and 19th of uh, June um, uh, online. Uh, usually we host this in Copenhagen. This year it's online. Uh, but make sure to, uh, to uh, check our website, allianceofdemocracies.org. Uh, register here and then you will uh, get a full-fledged uh, program. So thank you very much. Uh, follow us on the various social media channels uh, to always get the latest updates. And uh, thanks for joining us and have a great day. Bye.